My name is Toby Mathis, and today we are going over how to properly manage your money like the rich. I'm going to have Tom Ferry on. Tom, you can unmute yourself and uh, show your bright and smiley face. There you are. Hey, hey sir. Toby. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, this is going to be fun. If, those of you guys who don't know Tom Ferry, uh, one of the most successful coaches on the planet. And I don't say coaches like he's not LeBron James coach. He's not you know, everybody needs a coach, but in the real estate field, there's nobody better than Tom. Uh, and he works with some of the most uh, successful real estate agents and other business. I know you branch out a little bit, but I always think of you as a real estate agent guy, like you're, you're showing people sure. how to become absolutely successful and masters at their craft. And I wanted him to come on and teach a concept. I've seen him do it before on properly managing your money like the rich because I happen to agree with just about everything he says. And uh, and we thought, hey, let, you know what, let's bring this to our group. Now, I know we only have an hour, so we're going to dive right on in. But I just, I'm always excited to have Tom on because Tom's like my other brother. I don't know. Uh, somehow, I, I don't know whether, ow, but I'm pretty sure we're related. I, Toby, I think it's the gray beard and the glasses. <laughs> I think that's it. It, it could be, it could on. be that. Yeah. Well, uh, so... I'll just jump in, but first of all, I'll just say hi, everybody. And, and Toby, as always, man, I, you know, I, for the people watching, I have been studying Toby and learning everything I can from him. It's, it's just kind of who I am. If you, if you read the wonderful book by Dr. Carol Dweck, uh, the book's called The Growth Mindset. Uh, if you haven't read it, I'd strongly encourage you to read the book. Um, it, it's not a motivational book in any way, shape, or form. It's how having the ability to understand why some people just simply will never change, will never take action, will hear all the best information and do nothing with it, where this other group of us just has this insatiable appetite to grow and to learn and we're willing to take risks and try new things. And, you know, you can argue there's no right or wrong in that, but, but so many people that I've worked with over the last 33 years, they, they come to me and they say, Tom, I want to be more successful. I want to sell more houses. I want to scale my business. I want to build my brand. I want to be a modernist as a real estate professional. I want to be able to avoid the, the common mistakes. I want to be able to, how do I manage the Zillows of the world and the iBuyers and the changing economies and interest rates? Keep me on the forefront. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we all know, you know, the answers are everywhere. But if you are in a fixed mindset, if you are stuck in, I'm not willing to change, I'm not willing to try, you're going to be poor. You're going to be in trouble. The people that are the wealthiest people I've met, and I have been blessed, Toby, is, you know, Toby being one of them, to very carefully curate, starting from 19 years old, the, the rooms I wanted to sit in, the people I wanted to get exposure to. I wanted to understand, like, how is it that she has an amazing marriage and a wonderful relationship and has 500 apartment doors and seems to do whatever she wants to do? And why does, why does this one over here who's came from family money and doesn't even understand the family business, doesn't understand anything that's going on, had every opportunity on the planet and just seems to blow it at every turn. I wanted to know why that was always happening, but maybe Toby, just, just so people have a little context for me. I was raised in Southern California and my parents got divorced when I was six and my earliest childhood memories of money, which by the way, all of you should explore that. What were your earliest childhood memories of money? I had two. When my parents separated, my dad was an entrepreneur and he was out starting a business. My mom had to go to work. And for the first time you know, in my young life, I can remember not enough cookies in the cookie jar that you know, I had to start, you know, making the beanie weenies and helping out. And I was the number two kid out of four. And like, there just was never enough. Like every pair of jeans I got were my older brother Matthew's hand-me-downs because, you know, he was getting too tall, right? And even though, you know, we all know with, like, with that entrepreneurial father over here, crazy ambitious, starting a new business, and everyone knows it started a business, you don't make any money for the first 10 years. So for the first 10 years of his ascension, by the time I'm 16, by the time I'm 16, I got very accustomed to hand me down clothes to, you know, not, not having the things that most kids had. And it wasn't looking, I, we were able to eat. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, we weren't impoverished, but, but I lived from kind of 16, 17, 18, 19 in this world of over here, I'm living in this very, you know, modest kind of lower middle income house 
with my mom and my sibs and just, you know, going to school and not really learning anything and, you know, eventually getting a mohawk and getting in trouble. And then over here on the weekends, I'd go stay at my dad's house and he was in Newport Beach, California with an ocean view driving a Rolls Royce and a Mercedes. And I was like, something's wrong here, right? Like there, something isn't adding up. And all it did for me was just create a lot of confusion, right? The book I met, I recommended Madeline is called The Growth Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, strongly recommended. Um, Stanford professor, brilliant woman. But, but I think all of us can relate to that in some way, shape or form that there was a lot of confusion for me in the early days of my life when it came to creating wealth and making money. Um, around 19 years old, I you know, was working at a grocery store from midnight to nines, had a mohawk. The, the only time they would let me work was midnight to nines, but I was always a hard worker, always kind of optimistic and fired up. But I remember looking down the aisle and seeing guys that I was working with that they were old. They were like 30 and we were all making 12 bucks an hour. And I remember saying to myself then, that's not my path. And I'm not judging the guys that were doing it. They're all wonderful people. They were terrific. One of the guys gave me one of his motorcycles. So I had transportation, like, so like, God bless the guy, right? Um, but I knew that wasn't for me. I knew there was more out there. I was that kid that when an airplane went, you know, through the air, I was one that was saying, where are they going? What did they do for a living? How did they get to go on that airplane? I wonder if they're going to like Hawaii or something. Like those were the thoughts that were always going through my head. So no one gave me any answers until I was about 20. And at 20, I went into sales and I started getting exposed to people like Earl Nightingale and you know Tony Robbins and Think and Grow Rich and all these incredible works of art. And that was really the beginning for me where I started to realize the answers are everywhere. The question was, was I willing to do the work, right? Was I willing to do the work? Well, fast forward a decade later and I'm 30, I crossed over a million dollars in net worth. I started buying real estate. I started making investments. I started doing all the things that, you know, any, any young entrepreneur who's had a little bit of exposure would do. But all the while, as Toby mentioned, I was helping real estate professionals as a business coach, guiding, directing, helping them write their strategy, develop their marketing plans, you know, helping them hire and fire and train and develop people on their teams and their brokerages. And the thing that I started to observe was, there was a lot of people that were really focused on their top line revenue and they didn't really focus on their bottom line. So they, they grossed a lot of money, but they never had a lot of money. And I thought that was interesting because, you know, my first ambition of course, was to help them get as much top line revenue as they could. And I, I could probably take the blame for some of that. I was helping them grow, 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 and wasn't really cognizant of like, okay, what's their real net. And, but I was shocked that when I would ask them, most of them weren't even paying attention to it. But then that led me down the path of, Hey, let's unpack, like, are you a corporation or not? Like when you get a check, what happens? Does it go to your name or somebody else's name? And I started to really get into like the next two or three years. Like, what are the, what are the ones that have a ton of money doing? One of the ones that have some money, what are they doing? And one of the people that always seem to have no money, what are they doing? And that's really, you know, this, this video that I shot, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago that went super viral. Um, of, of just the lessons that I learned in just observing, you know, after at that point, 30,000 hours of, of private coaching sessions. And I, it wasn't just about strategy anymore. And that was like, I don't care what your gross is. What's your net? How much money are you saving? How many apartment buildings are you buying? What investments are you making? I got really into that because I realized I can help people make money. Like that's the easy part. But if they had no money at the end of it, if they couldn't pay their taxes or they, they weren't protecting themselves, which is why I got so involved with Toby, like to help protect themselves, I wasn't doing them the best service. And, and probably like many of you, like we're still on that journey today. I'm still helping people. I had a client that I just took on recently that Toby made $17 million in one line item from his business. And from that made 568,000 bucks. I'm like, Houston, there's a problem here. I'm like, either you don't want ordinary income and don't want to pay any taxes. I went through every one of the line items. I said, can we adjust the commission splits? Can we, you know, what are the adjustments we're going to make? Otherwise, the work and stress involved in $17 million in top line revenue for $568,000 was not worth it. I actually made the argument that if he was unwilling to make the change, we should drop the $17 million in revenue and just go focus on the other businesses where he's got high margins and high profit and less stress. 100%. Like that, that's the kind of stuff, Toby, that I'm into. So, so with that said, I want to show you guys the same thing that you know 15 million people have seen on YouTube, and I've shared it multiple times at multiple events, and, and maybe just maybe it'll create the awakening in you that it has in so many other people that have seen this. And, and I hope when I show it to you, Hector, are you ready to give them the slides? 
I hope when you see this that it just kind of looks like common sense because the, when I get to the very last slide, and Toby, that's where you and I can really have some fun and unpack some of the lessons that I've learned. And, and again, I've been honored to, to get to know, you know, if you guys don't know Toby well, like Toby's doing all the right stuff. He's an entrepreneur, but he focuses the same way I do, which is on take the money you're making and create more passive income. Put yourself in a position where you don't have to work anymore, but getting ahead of myself. So if we're not connected in some way on social, I would say connect with me at whatever your favorite platform is. Um, so this is basically what I shared one day at an event. I said, what I've, what I've basically discovered in my work, and again, I'm, I am blessed because of the work that I do, that I do get to meet a lot of remarkable people. Um, I, I recently moved to Dallas, Toby, I think I mentioned to you about four years ago. And, and now at this point in my career and my life, it's about where I live and who I'm surrounding myself with. Now, it was always that way, but it was harder when I was younger and didn't have a lot going on and didn't have a lot to contribute to others. But, you know, today, selecting the place where I live was really important. I didn't want to be in a neighborhood surrounded by a bunch of people with young kids. I've got a 24 and 22 year old. I wanted a, an empty nester lifestyle. I wanted to be in a high rise and, and just the building that I'm in, the co-owner of the Clippers inside there, the guy that started Heritage uh, you know, Auction is inside there. Like there's eight billionaires in my building that Toby, two of them I saw this morning when I'm taking my little puppy outside to go to the bathroom in the morning. Like there's so, there's so much information I'm just obsessed with what is it that these men and women do? Even today, what is it that they're doing and how are they operating? And here's what we know. If you look at the US, it's basically 5% of the population is what they would call generational wealth, right? Generational wealth, meaning they've, they've amassed enough that their kids and probably their grandkids will be just fine unless they screw it up. And you can go to the top 1%, but we know the top 1% of earners is only $450,000. It's not a lot of money when you talk about the top 1% of earners. I'm talking about top 1% of net worth. The top 1%, if we had it on that list, would be transformational wealth. You know, the billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. But I think all of us right now watching can relate to what it would mean to be in the top 5%. And, and that number, is about $50 million in net worth, which Toby, when you think of it, 50 million is a lot. But when you think about some of the people we've gotten exposed to, 50 million is kind of tiny, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you look at the, the graph, it goes like this, you know, like, hey, they're worth a little bit. And then it goes like this, zoop, straight up. Well, so, Warren Buffett, but, what was he, 59 when he hit his first billion? And then it was, right. and, and now it's 90 billion. And you're like, well, he, right. made, he makes most of his money since he's retired. It's the way exactly. I look. And I, I actually personally coach one of the CEOs of one of his businesses. And, you know, he gets access to Warren and, you know, to, to Greg Abel, who's now the heir apparent and, you know, quarterly meetings with Greg. And, you know, there, that's an excellent example, but it's, it's almost too extreme sometimes for people. It's, it's mm -hmm. so unrelatable to think, the way Warren Buffett operates, but there's, there's lessons inside that. And certainly one I'll share today, but the next one, I know you're looking at this is 15%, the top 15% in the U S they're deemed wealthy primarily because they paid their home off and they bought a house, maybe two, and they've got about a $3 million net worth. And I, I say to every one of my clients, that should be the starting place. The starting place should be pay off your home, right? And I know, you know, we talk about buy, borrow, and die, Toby, as a strategy. But in this case, you know, my advice is, hey, pay off your home, no right? Day. Maybe maybe pay off a second one. Maybe buy like a duplex or something. Pay that off. Get some cash flow, right? You know, for you know all the easy stuff, 401ks, yada, 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 basically invest in weight. And if you do those just basic strategies, you could be in the top 15%, right? Anybody could do that with a little bit of discipline. But what I observed in just all my hours of coaching is, it, it didn't sometimes matter how much money people made. You still, I still saw 80% of the people I was talking to basically were on a path to end up flat broke. They were going to end up having made all this money, bought all this, excuse my French, garbage, shit, dumb mm -hmm. emotional purchases for decades and decades and decades, right? And never did the fundamentals that create wealth. So, so when I started to look at it and started deep, you know, deep diving into like, how do you manage your money? The first thing I saw was like, there was three types of money managers and 80% of the people I talked to, they got a check, like a commission check, a dividend check, whatever, you know, whatever their money was coming in. And it went to a personal account. There was no LLC. There was no S corp, no C corp, no corporate structure at all. And, and Toby, you know, this is, this is like, you know, Toby, Toby 101, right? That is the biggest no, no on the planet. 
And, and I'm shocked. Even just last week, I was doing an event in New Jersey and somebody raised their hand and said, well, yeah, but in our state, you know, you can't be a independent contractor and have a corporation. And then somebody else stood up and said, no, actually you can. And I'm like, the fact that there's even confusion about it and somebody's got a fixed mindset, it can't be done instead of saying, hey, why don't I call someone and figure out if I can do that? Let me reach out to a CPA. Let me call a tax accountant. But, but I was shocked, 80% of the people, and they were making, some of them making $500,000 in commissions, $800,000 in commissions, and all of it was coming to them. So they had no write-offs in, in most cases. And what we know from people like Toby is the people that don't have a corporate structure in place are infinitely more likely to be audited by the IRS every single day. So not only are they not getting all the tax advantages because they earn good money, they're also putting themselves at risk every single day unnecessarily because because an LLC costs eight hundred ninety nine dollars, yep. like some some ridiculous thing like that. But then, as I continue to analyze, and again, we have fifteen thousand clients. I have two hundred thirty seven business coaches. I want to I want to stress as I was analyzing, this wasn't just me. This is across you know twenty nine different countries. So you know things get different when you're talking Australia, New Zealand, all throughout Europe, Canada, Mexico. So I'm really talking U S specific here. The the next one was, at least in this case, they listened to Toby. They 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 got an LLC maybe maybe two and when a check came in the first thing i said to them is if you're an independent contractor meaning you're not an employee you're not you know you're not a full-time employee you're not getting taxes and all that stuff taken right out of your account first thing you got to do is you got to put aside money for taxes because if you got ten thousand bucks you don't have ten thousand dollars right sure. you got state federal and everything else right so i say put aside at least 35 percent of that maybe go to 40 percent if you live in new york or california just to be safe right and and just watching people go oh yeah but see the ones that were really smart they were already doing it. They were like, well, of course, I just put money aside over there because that dollar isn't all mine. 40 cents of it goes over there. I don't want it in my account. I want to put it over inside that account. I want to pay my taxes quarterly, get that out of the way, never get behind, always do the right thing. And then a percentage went to their business account to make sure that they were operating their business. Usually, you know, call it 25 to 30 percent, dependent upon, you know, what they had in place, assistance, staff, etc. And then the balance went to their home account. Now, what was interesting for me was watching people do this. I was like, well, they're infinitely better than that. Right. But is there another way? Is there more to this? Cause I'd ask this person, well, how many investment properties do you own? Well, I was, I'm thinking about doing it. I'm just saving up cash right now. I'm like, okay, that's fair. Have you put some money in the market? Well, my spouse has a job and you know, she's got a 401k yada, yada. So we're doing some savings there. We, you know, we put some money into the stock market, but I don't really like it. It makes me nervous or worse now. Occasionally, I'll hear, Oh, I've been buying crypto and I'm like, Oh shit, please sell. <laughs> just please sell. Right? Like I bought crypto too. Right. But I knew it was kind of, you with me? Like there's, there, there just wasn't enough behind it to make any sense to me, right? You know, to the moon, Dogecoin, right? Um, but you know, my kids had fun with it. You know how I knew it was crazy, Toby, when my 18 year old son created his own coin. <laughs> that's when, I, that's when I knew. I'm like, okay, this is kind of nuts, right? And then people went and again, out and bought you, it, probably. Like, oh, oh no, absolutely. He sold it to, he sold it to a, a bunch of his friends, and and then one of my employees bought a bunch and then sold. And then my son called me and said, I forgot that I'm supposed to have money inside the account to make it an actual currency. <laughs> 18, <laughs> lessons learned, right? But my point to you is this, not razzing, you know, if you're, if you were long on crypto and, and I still own crypto, but it's like 0.0001% of my net worth. I just, I want to be socially relevant. That's mm -hmm. why I did it just to be very clear. But, but I knew there was another way. So then when I started looking at and I, 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 you know, today I work with, I was just thinking one of my clients, Brian, I won't say his last name in fairness to him, very successful real estate broker, mm -hmm. uh, worked for a company called Sotheby's, has a net worth of almost $30 million. When I looked at people like him versus people that were in this category, I was like, okay, and, and I know crypto and Bitcoin are different. I'm totally with you on that. Um, his looked a little more like this. Mm -hmm. and, and as I started to observe the people that were more systematic, more disciplined, more organized they had set up processes in place so so when they got a check it just bing 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 things just started happening so the first thing obviously is they they've got a corporation money goes to their tax account always right always never want to get in trouble over there right cost of doing business cost of living in the greatest country on the planet pay your taxes percentage would go into running their business and then from the home account it all got dispersed and the wealthiest people, and again, notice my thing in yellow there, these are samples, not a plan. This is not my recommended plan. I'm just giving you the example, like 
hey, I got to have some money in a cash account because I always want to have cash, right? And, and maybe, you know, like I did the 529B and I watched a lot of other people do a 529B and Toby, you and I said recently, boy, I wish I would have just bought my son's duplexes anywhere mm-hmm. in the country instead, you know, because whatever. But we did the 529B. Then you put money in the market, stocks, bonds, you buy more real estate, you do some retirement accounts. The, the point was, it was, it was so obvious to me the difference between someone that had the best of intentions, they're out making money. Remember, all these men and women are making money. They're selling houses, they're being productive, and they're real estate, mortgage, title insurance, you know, some stock, you know, some, some, you know, some other small businesses that we're working with, a truck driving company in Australia. Like they were all good entrepreneurs. They had figured out how to solve problems for their customers and generate money. The problem was it was what they did with the money when they got it. See, I have a feeling a lot of you out there, you've figured out how to be a great at what you do, how to serve your customers, how to make a difference, how to bring them value. So you're creating the money. Just the thing that I observed was I look at my industry and I say 80% of the people, if they, if they stay in the business, end up with nothing. And I just, it breaks my heart. So I've been talking about a bunch, sharing a bunch, saying to them, Here, here's your minimum, call Toby, get yourself set up, you know, get, get your trust done, do all the things that we know to do. Right. But at the minimum, you start here. And then what's fun is I say, look, the next level is you go sit down with your bank and you say, every time I deposit this much money over here, I want you just to equally divide it this way. Right. And, you know, whether you're doing it on your phone or some of the stuff that could be automatically done at all kinds of different banks. And I know not all banks do it automatically. So, you know, I know I know the deal. You either have a bank that does or you don't. And if you don't, you have to do it yourself. And if you do, it's all done for you. The point is simply this. They have a plan and a process. Mm -hmm. They have a plan and a process. Now, what's fascinating for me today is because I've been able to carefully curate so many amazing people. Toby, when we were talking last, I mentioned that my, my stepmother, Pua, Fiona Ferry, she moved from Honolulu to Los Angeles when she was like 18 and a half years old. She you know, didn't go to college, right? She was you know, this kind of cute, you know, half Russian, half Polynesian, you know, rock star who just says, I don't want to be in the islands anymore. She moves to LA. You know, I think she was like a waitress at first. And then, right, then she goes into the title insurance business. She becomes a title rep. She starts to meet a bunch of people. And then she meets this guy, Billy. And Billy, who's now sort of fondly referred to as Uncle Billy, said, you know, I read this great book called How to Buy Real Estate for No Money Down. Do you remember that book, Toby, from like a million years ago? And, and she says, well, how many of you bought like cents? He said, well, I bought about 700 so far. Now he stopped buying real estate around 1986, 87. Mm -hmm. Today he owns 3000 doors between Santa Barbara and San Diego. And if you know anything about those marketplaces, it, it, it's, Mm -hmm. it's more money than most of us could ever imagine. Now here's, what's great. My stepmom, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to figure out not just how to be the greatest title salesperson on the planet to go out and you know, deliver value and make money and serve my customers, but mm-hmm. I'm going to live on next to nothing and I'm just going to buy real estate. I, I jokingly, because she's one of my closest friends and today she's 78 years old and she'll be at my son's graduation in a couple of days. Like, you know, she, she's not stepmom, like she's, she's mom, mom and like a dear friend and a mentor to me, someone that I call on all the time to say, what do you recommend? How did you do this? I'm looking at this deal. Give me some insight. I've got a lot of those people in my life and I hope you do too. My point to you is she just figured out a long time ago, it doesn't matter how much money you make. The only thing that matters is what is your plan and what are you doing with it? Now you've heard that 8 million times before, but I thought I thought I would summarize Toby, something I did recently for a bunch of my clients. I had about 3,000 people in the room in Vegas, and they, they know a lot of the things that I do because I'm very open about, hey, I've invested in 125 startups. I had three sell in the last week, but I also had five fall apart in the last month, right? So, you know, winning more than I'm losing, I, they know that I do apartment syndications. They know that I bought 700 doors just in the last 12 months, but they knew I was, you know, buying on my own prior to that and figured out you can go further, farther with partners and friends. And having a little bit of a lot is way better than having a few and owning it all yourself. And so I'm very vocal about this with my clients. So, so they asked me basically a question, Hey, what have, what are the wealthiest people you spent time with? You know, my buddy who's the former CEO of American Airlines, right? Who lives in my building, who I see, you know, just about every day in the gym, or my stepmom, or Uncle Billy, or Steve Azonian, or my my friend who started a little company called Realtor.com and sold that recently for like a billion five, right? Like 
all these, the guys that started Zillow, if you're familiar with that company, friends of mine, right? When you spend enough time with all these men and women, you really see the clues. So, so the first one that I would challenge everybody on is this. Have you defined what it means to be wealthy? Not just your number, but what does it really mean for you? And, and the thing that I tell people all the time is, rather than just write down a number, I'm, I'm a little more fixated on how much cash flow you want, right? How much cash flow do you want? How much cash flow do you want? And then the second thing is, what's the lifestyle that you desire? What's the lifestyle that you desire? That to me is the game. And then I say, going one step further, the bigger issue is for a lot of us, we've had to have figure out how do I shift my identity from someone that is feeling like I'm not worthy of it to someone that I can actually go out and create it. I'm always blown away by the number of people that come to me and literally say to me, Tom, you don't understand. My parents got divorced or my parents made a lot of money, then they lost it all. And I just kind of had this glass ceiling in my mind. If I don't, you know, if I just kind of make this much, I can just be okay. And if I make too much, I just see too many people losing it all. We all have this story in our head about wealth and wealth creation. And what I would just challenge you on is what's your story? And like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a wonderful book called Affirmations of Wealth, and it's not affirmations like, you know, I'm the best, that, that kind of stuff. The very beginning of the book is actually 36 questions that help you unpack your current beliefs and your current, your current psychology, specifically about wealth and wealth creation. And I remember going through the exercises of what were your earliest childhood memories, and I remember just thinking, there's never enough. And if you've always got that thought in your background, in your psyche, in your DNA, you're probably not going to be the kind of person that's going to make the sacrifices you need to make, go out and make the extra phone calls, do the things you have to do to go create wealth, take the risk because you're always afraid that there's not enough. Mm -hmm. So I would just challenge you, what is your identity about? The book was called Affirmations of Wealth. I know sometimes I talk too fast. Affirmations of Wealth by a guy named John Alexandrov. John Alexandrov. So I don't know if the book is still in print. It was a long time ago when I read it. But, you know, probably like all of you, I've read all the books you can imagine. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Thinking Grow Rich, right on down the line, just trying to figure out what's going to work for me. But this is the big one. The thing that I would stress for all of you is you've got to carefully curate wealthy people around you. Carefully curate wealthy people around you. I used to call it your financial fortress. So I've had the same two attorneys for almost 25 years. Right? One's kind of the junior attorney who helps me with contracts and paperwork, and one's more of an M&A attorney and the guy that I want on my side if somebody's coming after me for any, you know, any reason, good or bad. Right? I've had the same tax strategist now for 22 years. Mm -hmm. One, because he's phenomenal at what he does, but number two, he's calling me about every 30 to 45 days to say, hey, this is what's coming up. Here are the changes. This is what you need to be aware of. Here's the next three moves. He's not a passive tax accountant waiting for me to say, here's my taxes now, figure out how we can do this. He's actively helping me with my program, actively helping me. Then I've got about 27 people that are just fantastic entrepreneurs that at any given time, like Toby being one of them, I can just call and say, I'm looking at this 125 unit building. It looks like this, feels like this, sounds like this. Here's some of the details. I just, I don't know, just my, my gut is, what am I missing in this contract, right? And just having people like that in your life. Now, my number may seem big to you, but remember, I started doing this when I was 30. I'm 52 now. So I've had a lot of time to curate. And, and these aren't all people that I can just call on a dime. But as an example, I recently acquired a third of a new startup company, and I was really fired up about this business. And you know, met with the founder, liked the business so much, said, hey, I'd like to buy a third of it. I'm going to take half that. I'm going to syndicate it to five or six people that could be super influential to help you grow your business. And there was two guys I called immediately, two guys that I've invested in, I don't know, 18 or 19 businesses with. And both of them, both of them said, love the business, too small for me. Call me when it's ready on the next. And, and I'm like, but I'm giving you a chance to get in early. And they both said no to me. And I said, are you guys saying no to me like I shouldn't do the deal? Or are you telling me, no, it's just too small for you? They're like, no, you should absolutely do the deal. We get it. When you get to a series B, call us. That's when it'll make more sense for us. Mm -hmm. Having people like that in your life, but the only way you get there is you got to get in the right rooms. Like you could argue this room right here is a, a, a Zoom room. But I think about like uh, an interview. All of you should listen to the interviews. The second one that Kevin Hart did with Joe Rogan. Kevin Hart with Joe Rogan. 
and it's the one he's wearing the light blue sweater because he's I think he's done a couple interviews and Toby he talks about and I'm a just I'm a huge Kevin Hart fan not just as a comedian but just the way he operates his life at least at least from what we can see you know as a consumer of of who he is um, he talked about the way he was raised in Philadelphia and how he grew up and you know he said it, it you know it wasn't easy nobody taught us how to you know think about money creating wealth is typical stories that we've all experienced probably all of us have had it in some way shape or form he said as he started to ascend in his career and he started making more and more money he started realizing that he didn't know what he was doing so he was making every wrong move and then he had the epiphany i've got to uh, you know got to get some advisors around me that can help me do all this stuff and he actually posted something recently where he said making money on your own isn't fun you got to make money with your friends you got to get the people that you love around you so you can all go enjoy the journey together which i agree with that a thousand percent but he talked about being at the super bowl and this was a while back when tom brady was still with the new england patriots and he said we were in a suite and he said you know i was kind of with all my friends like my posse and he said i i look out out the door and he goes and i see robert Kraft walking by and he said man that guy owns a New England, that, guy, that guy's a billionaire, right? And he said, the game was over at this point. And he said, I'm just going to go follow him. And his buddy's like, no, 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 man, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he's like, no, 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 like, I'm just going to go check it out. And he's like, so he walks over and he says, I knock on the door. Somebody opens the door and he goes, I look inside. And he goes, Jeff Bezos is inside there. Tom Brady's already inside there. Robert Kraft's inside there. He said, all these just uber successful people. And he said, hey, I'm Kevin Hart. He goes, I was asked to, to they asked me to come in right obviously he's lying his ass off he gets inside this room and he says he goes i'm standing there and he goes my buddy's behind me like you know we shouldn't be inside here this is you know this is not our room man like this isn't for us we're just like comedians right this isn't our jam and he's like no no no, man like if i get in the right rooms i'm going to meet the right people i'm going to have the right opportunities and, mm -hmm. and toby he literally says in the interview he said i see jeff bezos the guy's like the richest guy on the planet at this moment he said i walk up to him he says Jeff Bezos, I'm Kevin Hart. I'm a comedian. It's nice to meet you. I don't have any questions for you, but man, I just want to shake your hand. I just want to say, like, I admire you. I admire what you've done. And he says, and Jeff Bezos was like, man, I've seen your work. You're really funny. He's like, if you ever need to talk to me sometime, here's my number. Give me a call. Now, yep. most people would watch the person go by and not do anything. Maybe you'd walk outside and take a look. Oh my God, was that Kim Kardashian? Right? Like, you know, what's going on here? Most people wouldn't knock on the door. Most people certainly wouldn't say, Hey, I was invited to get in when they weren't supposed to. Most people just wouldn't do it. And I'm challenging you who are you spending all your time with? Who are your advisors? Because for me, when I, when I show you everything else, right, it's obvious willingness to sacrifice. You know that. My, my stepmom's best advice to me when I started this business 20 years ago, Thomas, you won't make any money for 10 years. I was like, that's not exactly a thought I want running through my head. But Toby, I understood what she meant. I understood that you, know, you had to be willing to sacrifice and do the hard work to travel as much as I traveled, to sacrifice time away from my family for the first 10 years, to build up a brand in the marketplace that was credible enough to you know, get the accolades that my team has received. So we, we all know that. But this is where I think all of you are thinking about. And I know maybe it's kind of hard for you to see this because maybe you're watching this on your phone. But when you look at the most successful people that I, that I know, they all play the long game, right? Toby, you're on this list, right? They mm -hmm. all buy real estate. They all do multifamily warehouses, hotels, shopping centers. Some buy single family residences, but you know, not so much because when that one person doesn't pay their rent, it's an issue. But when it's a fourplex or a 20plex or a 200plex, you're going to have one person not pay their rent and it's not really a factor. All of them, all of them are obsessed with acquiring cash flowing businesses that they, they don't have to run. Cash flowing businesses that they don't have to run. And sometimes that is a business that you're just able to invest in, not a public equity. That's different. I mean, like me investing in buying 30% of this company that's already spitting off cash flow and I can help leverage it and grow it, but I don't have to run it. I don't have to be involved in the day to day operations. The third one, of course, is investing in stocks, but only stocks that pay dividends, yep. right? Otherwise, like the appreciation is great, but I, I want the cash flow or I want my account to grow faster because of the dividends. And of course, the fourth one is yes, many of them invest in startups, 
buying real estate, multifamily. And again, I want to stress to you guys, like I can go super deep and tactical with you. When I'm standing in front of somebody and they say, I can't afford to buy an investment property. I say, let me ask you a question. How much equity do you have in your house? And they go, oh my God, I've, my equity has gone up like through the roof. And I'm like, why don't you take some of the cash out and go buy another property? Why don't you take the cash out and go buy new construction that's going to go up faster? Keep this one as an investment property. Congratulations, you're in the game. If you can't do that, could you invest in a REIT, which means I'm buying into a public asset that is holding a lot of real estate, and now I'm getting the dividends and I'm getting the tax advantages through the REIT, or can you do a syndication? And there's, there's thousands of people around the country that do syndication deals on multifamily, on warehouses, on shopping centers, on hotels, where again, you're riding next to somebody else. Yeah, are they going to take a two and 20 on it? Of course, but they're doing all the work. You're putting your money in. You get the taxes, appreciation, uh, all the advantages. Like there's a lot of different ways. And what I would tell you is knowing what I know now, I would have done that way earlier than Toby. What I was doing was just acquiring duplexes because it felt like the most affordable thing for me, right? Anything under four units because of the kind of traditional financing you can get. So I would challenge every one of you, especially if you're like playing the long game, you can't go wrong with real estate. But then think about all the businesses in your town. I always start with like, where could I have the most influence? Where could I move the needle? How could my insight, intellect, not time, not time is the key, help this business owner do better? Could I spend an hour or two with them every week, giving them insight and guiding them and own a piece of the business and get a dividend, but none of you need another job, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. I, I'm also like, I'm shocked by how many people say, hey, you can have like five or six side hustles. And I'm like, why would you have five or six side hustles? Why don't you figure out like where you can really have impact versus continually trading time for money, right? Investing in stocks that pay dividends, of course, investing in startups, I would warn all of you, because I've invested in a lot of them, you got to be really comfortable with basically eight out of 10 failing. And if you can't stomach eight out of 10 failing, I would not get into the startup world. Toby, you, you know, my wife who you met at the events, she, the startup world drives her insane. She is old fashioned Italian. Let's buy more real estate. Let's put more money in bonds. You know, like, let's do more of that stuff. Very safe. Mm -hmm. But when the startup stuff hits, man, you get, you get big lifts, but you got to be comfortable losing eight out of 10 to win big over here, which just most people don't have the stomach for. They, they but actually, the last one. Sorry, yeah. I'm just going to throw this out there because it's, they did a study on this and it was one out of 13 and you'll be profitable. Yeah. When you're, when you're, yeah. when you're messing around with startups, you, you're going to lose on the vast majority of them. But if you're successful in one out of 13, you'll actually make money. I just remember 1, that. 000, yep. Yeah. I had a, I'll give you guys an example. I have a, uh, my former brother-in-law called me and he said, Hey, I'm uh, I'm going to invest in this company. And I was like, Hey, didn't I tell you, you have X amount of dollars. And my advice was invest in like 10 or 15 companies with that same 150 grand. Don't, don't, he's like, no, no, I, I'm really excited about this. It's a marijuana transportation company up in Calgary. And I was like, you know, I saw that same pitch deck and I passed on it because it's just too easily replicated. So, you know, they don't have first mover advantage that, you know, like all the reasons why, right? Like I have eight questions, Toby, that I ask every single startup that usually by two or three, I've already said no to, mm -hmm. right? And if you want, I'll share the eight questions. You can share them with everybody. But the long story short is he does the investment. It's the only 150 he has to invest. He didn't buy real estate. Instead, he puts into this company nine months later, it's gone. He lost yeah. all 150,000 bucks. Don't do that. I'd much prefer you start in order. Buy more real estate. Buy more real estate. And the last one you guys are all doing, it's why you guys are here. And it's why I'm such a fan of Toby, which is they invest in themselves. Mm -hmm. Now I know there's 10 more things. So, so Toby, look at that list. What did I, what did I miss? I think you're like, it, I think you're hitting it. Like if I'm, if I'm looking on it uh, at it from an investment standpoint, I think you're hitting everything right on the head. I would probably start with dividend stock because it's the cheapest and it yeah. produces results immediately. For a hundred bucks, you could buy a great company that's paying, that has great cash flow and you start paying attention to those types of companies once you start investing in them. And then uh, on the real estate, the only other thing is I, I might say there was this old concept of the two mountains and uh in our younger years, our ego is on the first mountain, being great at what we do, being great at our profession. And then as you 
once you achieve that, then you kind of go onto the second mountain and, and you start going into this, I want to give something back and create something that lasts beyond me. And uh, th that would be the only thing that I would add probably as, as a six with an asterisk on it is, yes. uh, is to find out what brings you that satisfaction. I think that again, using cliche statements, but uh, when people say money can't buy happiness is because you haven't given enough away. There's, 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 that's the truth is there's yes. a giving component that I think works magic that with, with wealthy people, which I think is probably why a guy like Jeff Bezos and everybody gets excited when somebody asks them something, it's a chance for them to give something back. Yes. And I've yeah, seen I it. love that. I love that you said that I'm going to add it into, into number six on this list. Uh, <laughs> there was actually like 10 on my original list and that wasn't on there, but you, you know, you know, that whether it's Breast Cancer Research Foundation, because my wife's had breast cancer twice, mm -hmm. uh, an organization called CASA, which is Child Advocate Services, kids that are basically in the system that need an advocate. Um, you know, we built an orphanage over in Ghana because my son at, you know, fourth grade had a pen pal partner who was essentially living under a tree with one little box where they had a, access to a computer and a bunch of my family friends, we all got together and raised a bunch of money and, you know, poured ourselves. So they, there's no doubt, like that has to be on the list. All right. So before someone talks about protection, oh, so someone just said, I'm a CASA volunteer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Toby, I got the eight questions. Can I read the eight questions that I ask Absolutely. every startup? Yep. Okay. So you guys want these? I'm going to, I'm just going to read them. So, so get ready to take some notes. So now remember, I'm willing to meet with just about anybody. Now I'm willing to meet with just about anybody because you never know who's going to have the next killer idea. Mm -hmm. You never know who's going to be the right person, but maybe have the wrong product at this time. They might be the right person, but they might have the wrong product. So I want to meet with them and go, man, I love you. This gal's got it going on, but that's a stupid idea. I would never <laughs> say that, but actually I probably would. But what I'm trying to do is cultivate the relationship. So the next time around that entrepreneur calls me again, does that make sense? So here's my eight questions. Number one, I say, Explain the problem you're trying to solve, but I'm a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Explain the problem you're trying to solve, but I'm a six-year-old. And I, I force them to take usually a very technical SaaS-based, you know, internet-based software company, or I'm an investor in a wine and bourbon spirits company. And my buddy was like, no problem. I'm trying to bring joy and happiness and alcohol to people. And I was like, got it. But if they can't explain the problem they're trying to solve, that's not a company I want to invest in. Businesses are basically formed to solve problems for a profit. That's what they do. So question number two, I ask, how large is the TAM and who's currently doing the most revenue? Mm -hmm. How large is the TAM? How long is the, how large is the total addressable market? Like how big is the market? How much money is being spent in this area? So this recent company, Toby, that I bought a third of, it's a recruiting business for residential real estate brokerages and teams. And there's a lot of money being spent in this space, but it's all being done in an old archaic way. But it's, it's, you know, it's probably conservatively a $250 million TAM, right? That, that's how much money's being spent. Then I asked number three, is your model different from others? If so, how? Is your model different from others? If so, how? Is your model different from others? If so, how? And then I say, please describe the differentiating factors. Mm -hmm. Please describe the differentiating factors. And then what happens is at this point, if they can't tell me, hey, look, our bobblehead is different because it costs us, you know, 50% less because we get it this way versus that way, or, you know, these wipes or these chips are dramatically better because of the way they feel. If they can't give me the differences, Mm -hmm. Then I have to ask myself, is the addressable market big enough for me just to invest in another company that does the same stuff as everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. That there's no differentiation. And sometimes the answer is yes, but it's because I keep going deeper on the questions. Number four, I ask, so just explain to me simply, how do you make money? Explain to me simply, how do you make money? Explain to me simply, how do you make money? And I love, because I invest in a lot of SaaS companies, right? Software as a service or even service as a service. When they say things like this, we charge a platform fee and we make profit on the platform fee. Then we get a success fee when we produce results and we get something there too. That to me, I'm like, 
You're right? Coming. Big enough addressable market. We could scale that like crazy. You know what I mean? Like I'm in, let's go. Um, I recently passed on starting an airline with a buddy of mine who used to be the CEO of American Airlines because I said, explain how you make money. His answer, Toby, confused me and scared me. And even though he said, look, I'm going to do it with a guy that you know who's very famous in this space, I said, it, it doesn't work for me. I don't understand it. You with me? And I don't invest in things I don't understand. I don't invest in things that are too complicated for my simple brain. Number five, I always ask, who's on the cap table? So who's already invested in the business? Mm -hmm. How much have you raised? What's your burn? What's the forecast to break even? When will you be profitable? That's all under question number five. Who's on the cap table? Who else is invested in this business? How much have you raised? What's the burn? How much is it costing you to operate the business every month and not making a profit? I invested in a company recently, Toby, the founder, uh, he and his buddies started a little company called Zillow. So he's got a track record. Mm -hmm. He raised $127 million essentially on a napkin. And he said, we won't make a profit for two years, but let me show you exactly how we're going to get there and not lose in the two years while we're building up this new identity. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I don't think Zillow made any money for like eight years. And that kind of worked out okay. So I invested, even though I knew we were going to lose money every month, right? Number six, tell me about your management team. And then tell me about all the key players. So if it's software, tell me about your engineers, tell me about your project managers, tell me about your chief product officer, tell me about your BI person. I'm asking all, like, tell me about everybody inside the organization. Usually what scares me when it's too early is they say, well, it's me, 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 and me. And that, that usually scares me. That's when I'm like, okay, we, we, might have a, we might have an overachiever. We might have a control freak. We might have somebody that hasn't figured out how to scale themselves. And if they can't figure out how to scale themselves, I'm not investing in that company. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the person that knows how to get people around them to do all the right things and grow together as a unit. And then I asked a very specific question if it's in my space, like, um, have you pitched? And I named like the three biggest VC groups in, the, in most of the places that I play. And if they don't know who they are or haven't been able to get into them, right, it also gives me some insight. So those are my eight questions. I've done about, I don't know, 1,200 pitches and invested in 125 companies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, about, you know, about one out of 10, I say yes to. And, you know, that's over a 10-year period. And it's absolutely paid off. It's it, it's interesting. I used to sit on a, on a, uh, in a business group and they would do the shark tanks. And they would give away right. things like fifty thousand dollars to right. the to the group that is they they tie it into the local university here at UNLV and we had the innovation center and stuff and it was fun just to sit there, and people that didn't get funded they would sit there you know oh this is it like no that's not it you're just uh -uh. not ready yet and and I, and right. I would say this I actually took two guys in we actually had the Vegas Tech Fund get fund to both yeah. of them. I went to people that I knew and I said what are you looking for. And then I made sure that we addressed those points when we did the marketing plan. It was like, oh, we want to see a five-year exit. We want to see this right. type of number return. I was like, okay, so guess what the numbers said? <laughs> right. It was like, well, I think, you're going to target that. Yeah, you and I have the same mindset. Like I, when I do those meetings, when I say no, it's a soft no. It's not a no. I'm, I'm like the your business the is over. <laughs> is like, no, I'm like, Hey, but Toby, what I want you to think about or Hey, let me introduce you to this person. You need to call Like you have a really good, you have a really good product, but it's not a company. Let me introduce you to a company that can bolt you in. And when you're ready, they can be the natural acquisition. So, I mean, I do that a lot for people and that's, that's just the, you know, karma, right? Just do good, do good, do good. And good things happen. And I think you learn. So one, one thing I would say that is uh, consistent with the folks that I deal with that are, I would say in the, let's say above $10 million range, or uh, we'll use your example. So you, you say the top 15%, three, 3 million and above, which I think is probably about right. Which as an aside, it's not who you think either. They've done no. studies on millionaires, top three categories, engineers, accountants, and teachers. Yeah. Engineers, accountants and teachers it's not who you think so a lot of these folks that are doing that are very successful it's not who you think but what they are yeah. is they're, they're they're voracious givers and they're voracious learners and while you're doing this you're uh, tell me if, if if i'm wrong tom you're thinking selfishly all the time of, of the information you're learning how it applies to other things you already have going on or things that you're doing in your business and you learn 
while somebody is pitching you. 1,000%. Yeah. 1,000%. I, but it goes back to that, that book that I hope – a lot of people are talking about Andrew Huberman right now, who I am a huge fan of. He's also a Stanford professor. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a podcast he was doing recently, and, he, and of course, he's referencing – the reason why most people will just simply fail is they've got a fixed mindset. And yeah. you know, the other Stanford professor, right, Dr. Carol Dweck. So you and I, we listen through similar, like I listen through, can I help this person? While yeah. I'm simultaneously thinking, what am I learning from this person? What is this person sharing? What insight do they have about the industry, the market, the world, the thing that we're studying right now, whatever it is, I'm just constantly absorbing new insights. And as you know, with me, like in our last podcast, I'm interviewing you, and I probably took ten pages of notes. And, and what I what I think is interesting because I mean I'll just relate this to my world because we do a lot of the tax stuff, and I don't do all tax things. Like so, we were talking to somebody really high net worth. It's funny because they said, uh, you know, the Trump version or my version, and I was like, what do you mean? He goes like, what? What I'll tell the bank that I'm worth or what I think I'm actually worth? He goes because I was fifty yes. million or 150 million. He goes you know, right, playing right. That. Uh, and it wasn't something I could do, but because I had spoken, it was another guy had on a podcast and I was like, but I know exactly who deals with this sort of issue. And I was able to pick up the phone and quickly make a referral. Um, and I think that there's a lot of that uh, people that love yes. to keep you within yes. their family. And so as you're going out, right. you're learning all these different people who are really great at different things. And uh, it's just constantly expanding your Rolodex. And if you don't think that's important, then uh, you're not paying attention because your Rolodex is, even if it's electronic or even if it's just up here, is uh -huh. very, very valuable. Um, and I think that's true. Like it's, We like to keep things within our communities, right? You know, it's interesting too. Uh, many of you probably know the name Jim Quick. If you don't know him, uh, he's the brain guy. He's Mr. Memory. You know, like literally you can give a thousand words. He'll read it twice and then repeat it verbatim. Um, he said to me all the time, he's like, how do you, how do you, when you get somebody's name and information, you put it inside your phone, what do you do? And I said, oh, I would go, Toby Mathis, tax strategist, wealthy guy, accountant, you know, insider, right? And I literally, that would be your name in my phone. So anytime uh, I'm searching for things, all of those people with any one of those keywords show up. And it was, he said, that's exactly how I want you to do it. That's exactly, that's, and I said, I, I probably got it from him. You know, I probably like read one of his books and, and just made that shift. And I hope everybody would do the same. All right, so I did see somebody that said, hey, Tom and Toby, look at a startup out of Philadelphia uh, called Sapient Industries, Sapient mm -hmm. Industries. Energy uses insights of commercial real estate kind of energy waste in the buildings to accelerate the carbon commitments. That's interesting. Cool. Anything, to, anything to save money. Right. That's right. An and anything with, anything with real estate, I'm always going to be far more interested. Thank you. I was actually just in Philly. Yeah. I noticed that my camera, Hector, just went a little strange or it just got, it just got darker in the room and I got orange. You mentioned Trump, Toby, and I turned orange. You, you did this to me. Okay. All right. He's fixed me. Okay. I'm back to myself. Oh, Thank hey, you. look at that. You look great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You, Hector. you, Thank you look you. presidential there for a second. <laughs> no, thanks, man. We just got no to bleach the hair. We just got to bleach your hair. Tom, and then, and then <laughs> oh, you good. Please edit all of that out. All right. Hey, Toby, so I know we we shared a bunch here. I just want to say thank you again for all that you guys do. I know you guys, like myself, you do a lot of events, you do a lot of training. Um, yeah. You know, I hope that, you know, for the person watching right now that I delivered some insights and value or I just validated what you knew. Sometimes just having what you knew validated is the key. My advice to you, though, is now it's about putting your butt on the line it's about actually doing something. I'm a, I'm a big fan of no more than three goals per quarter. No more than three goals per quarter. Sometimes no more than three goals for the year 100%. versus trying to have a list of 50 things. Like if you, if you walked into my apartment in Dallas on the, you know, the window looking out to North Dallas, out to SMU, my wife and I both have like, here's the three most important goals, right? We're, we're paying off this line of credit that we use to buy a bunch of real estate, almost done with that one, right? So we want to get it done by the end of the quarter. How much money we want to invest this quarter? And then a bunch of like relationship related goals. And for us right now, just inside this quarter, those are the three most important things. Get that on your bathroom mirror. And then the second thing I would tell you is if you don't add some accountability, Mm -hmm. uh, I use my children, especially when they were younger. I would say, if if Daddy can go out and do ABC one two three in this quarter, what would you guys want in return? 
-hmm. boy, you have no idea when you offer an Xbox to a 10 and 12 year old, how much they will bring up what you needed to do to make it happen. And, and if you don't have kids, then I say, go to your church, go to the, the group that you want the most influence with, the group that you want to contribute the most to. It could be a soup kitchen, your church, it could be something. I had a client, Toby, that she was the former number one agent in the world for Century 21. Mm -hmm. She hit a certain level and just got bored, had enough real estate, like, like she did all the right things, but, but still was young and had this enormous base of business, never was married, no kids, right? Living in San Jose, went to church every Saturday and Sunday. I said, why don't you do something for the church? That was it. Just the question. Why don't you do something for the church? Mm -hmm. And she said, there was a vacant lot they were using as a parking lot next to her church. So she figured out who the owner was, made him an offer, person accepted the offer. She went to church like on Sunday and said, pastor, I just want to make an announcement. I just bought the vacant lot next to us. I'm building a YMCA there for the children of San Jose and I'm sure. donating it to the church. Well, you know, 6,000 people, one of these like mega churches, 93 real estate agents left immediately because, you know, she's going to get every referral you could imagine. That wasn't her intention. What, what she said to me was, I was just bored of my business. What you did is you got me to think about putting my ass on the line again, yeah. stepping up and doing something big. It took her three years. I was there. We cut the, you know, the ribbon and, you know, she donates this YMCA to the church. She made more money in those three years than she had ever made in a three-year period of her career. And the market wasn't on her side. You with me? But it was because she just put her butt on the line and said, Dumb. this is what I'm going to do. Tom, this is the only thing I'm going to add because you just, you've nailed it. It's reaping and sowing. And she yes. didn't even realize it yeah. that she was sowing some goodness out there. It was old yes. Andrew Carnegie, the richest man yes. in the world, came out yep. from a he wrote something called the gospel of wealth. And he says, millionaires are the trustees of the poor. Some people are just really bad at making money. So you got to, you yeah. got to help them. And here's the funny punchline. When you help them, you make more. Yes. It's almost like a yes. universal rule. It's like, if you go out there and you help people, because I keep seeing this, it was somebody else that built a volleyball stadium and all this other stuff. And he yes. just can't get yes. out of his own way. It's like the business is just spiking at him. Right. It, uh, and it's, I just see that over and over again. And I hope that, uh, that was the one thing is, is that giving side uh, yes. over and over again. When you see wealthy people, you see that they're always, you know, sometimes it's connived like, yeah, okay. I can get a huge tax benefit out of it. Sure. A sure. And things like that. But that's not the reason they're doing it. If they're doing it yeah. for the right reasons, they can't get out of their own way. And you see that when you look at families, the Rockefellers versus the Vanderbilts, if you ever just want to do a case study, just the Rothschilds, mm -hmm. like you just start looking at these, the, the Hershey foundation, look at that thing. Right. $13 billion or Ikea is owned by a charity. Like when you start looking right. at what makes these folks tick, you can see that that is a component in almost every one of them. Yeah. You know, Rolex is a nonprofit. I did not know like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. That was another interesting one I heard recently. And I spent a lot of time in Jacksonville, Wyoming and like, you know, the, the wealthiest Americans basically donated all of that land. Now, now I think they donated all the land and they created a bunch of new tax codes. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely did that. So like, there, there was some, there was some intentionality. Mar-a-Lago Mar yeah. has got conservation easements that, that, that got Trump about what, 12 billion or $12 million <laughs> in deduction or something, yes. something silly. But hey, yeah. I know we got to wrap, but I want to say thank you. On the last podcast, we talked about asset protection and one of my houses was actually in my personal name. So that has been solved. Right. So thank you. You, you gave me that insight. We're talking for the people that are listening. I've, I interviewed Toby on my podcast and we're talking about, you know, the, basically all the mistakes to avoid. It was a really, fa and I, again, I mean, I'm taking 10 pages of notes, but one of the things you said was, and don't ever have any assets in your own name. And I wrote down, is this house still like, is that house in my name? And I called my, like, and he said, he goes, yeah, but there's not a lot of advantage to it. I said, except there's a lot of equity. And if, if I ever got sued, you know, that that would be the asset they would go after. And he's like, no, 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 I go, just, just do it anyway. <laughs> just put it in an LLC. Yeah. And, right? and so, so thank you. I, I appreciate that. And if, and if anybody likes the asset protection stuff, we'll put up a link so you can come and do the tax and asset protection course. This was strongly a, recommended. This was a true, we just wanted to bring value to you guys and give you something cool. Yeah. We're going to put this as a recording. We're going to let it live on the YouTube channel. So thank you, Tom. If somebody does want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? I know you put up all I would uh, I would follow me on Instagram and send me a DM there. Follow me on Instagram, send me a DM. That's the the place where I'm probably the most I'm active on everything, but you know, Instagram seems to have most of my attention right now. So at Tom Ferry 
on Instagram, connect with me there, send me a DM. It's always me responding. I respond in emojis, you know, I misspell things, then you'll, you'll know it's me. All right, Toby, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody out there. Put your butt on the line, do something big, and I love give, 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 right? So spot on. Thank All you right. so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Share it with somebody you love.